We've come. We've come to give God the glory. To give God the glory. Oh yes, we've come. Oh yes, we've come to give Him praise. To give Him praise. We've come. We've come to give Him the honor. To give Him the honor. Let's magnify Him. Let's magnify Him. All of our ways. In all of our ways. Who are we? We're interceding. Christian Center. We hope that you felt welcome. From the time that you enter. God bless you, beloved. Once again, Pastor Schaefer, the pastor of Interceding Christian Center, located in the city of West Memphis at 414 Thompson Avenue. To God Almighty be the glory. Before we get into this very interesting sermon, I want you to go and subscribe to us on this side and like us on this side. <laughs> hey man, hopefully I get that right. But to God be the glory. Recently, the Lord dropped something inside my spirit that talked about the state of the church. And as he spoke to me about the state of the church, he took me over to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 3. In verse 3, it speaks of, in terms of the lights being out, the lights being out. And he told me how the light seems to be out in the church. Not out in terms of out in the, in the open words we can see it, out in terms of it's been blown out. But before we get too deep into this sermon, let's go into the sanctuary here with Thus Said the Lord. Come on, let's go. Hallelujah. I know sometimes the worship team don't know where I'm going, but they go up in the worship. <laughs> sometimes they don't know how I'm going, but they go up in the press into the presence. Your presence is heavenly. Hallelujah. No distractions, no distractions, no distractions, no distractions. Hallelujah. Get your Bible and go with me over to the first, first Samuel, first chapter of Samuel, first book of Samuel. Samuel, first Samuel chapter three. First Samuel chapter three. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You have to. You have to sometimes look over me. Sometimes I gotta just let everything else go. Sometimes I gotta just release it all. I gotta turn to the author and finish my faith and let him know how much I love him, how much I appreciate him. Sometimes I got to just let everything go. I surrender all. Oh, I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. 1 Samuel chapter 3. Beginning at verse 1, we find these words of the Lord. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of God was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Ah, shit. And it came to pass a time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out into the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was and Samuel was laid down to sleep. That the Lord called Samuel and he answered, Here am I. Then he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou calleth me. And, he, and Eli said, He said, I call not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, who's calling you, Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I call not, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not know the Lord. It was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord said unto, called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Hear mine, for thou didst call me. Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant hear. So Samuel went down and lay down 
in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times. The Lord came and stood <laughs> and called as at other times. Thank you, Holy Spirit, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, speak for thy servant here. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word manifest in this house. We're praying, Lord God, right now that your people will receive your word, Lord God. A word that will heal, deliver, set free, Lord God. Allow the victory to truly be theirs. Now we give you glory on this day and honor for all things. Let your word be received and let your word be applied in lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, beloved. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I want to minister to you for just a little while on this morning. Amen. For a little while on this morning. Amen. As the Lord gives to me to minister to you. But as I was reading this scripture, something else dropped inside of me, Sister Glory. I, I tell you, the Lord is just something else. Something else dropped inside of me that's not going to change the direction I'm going to go in this morning. But I want to point out something to you. Point out something to you. Initially, the Lord called Samuel three times. Three times. As a parent, once we've called our child once, we're going to say, you ain't answering him. Then we end up going to him, right? But the Lord called him three times. And Eli didn't understand it was the Lord calling him and eventually. Eli realized the Lord was calling him and then the Lord didn't call him just the fourth time he came and stood <laughs> before him and called <laughs> hallelujah you'll get that later but we're moving on this morning amen in this story I want to talk to you this morning I want to talk to you about a few words that are hidden in plain sight hidden in plain sight a treasure that sits on the surface easily to be found by one who's really seeking the truth. You ever been in a place where you're looking for something you can't seem to find? It's right there in front of you, though. When someone's really seeking the truth, you can find this treasure. It's elusive to those who are seeking their own self-gratification. They're not really seeking the truth, so therefore, it's hard for them to find that treasure. Man has a way that he thinks is right, but the end thereof is death. Man is searching for something that he thinks is right, but the end thereof is death. I'm going to minister to you this morning, hallelujah. Something that the Lord dropped into my spirit. Going back to verse 3 here. Verse 3 here. Is it up on the screen, son? Hallelujah. And air. The lamp of God went out into the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down asleep. I want to minister to you something, and I want to present a question to you, because this question has to be presented to the church. It has to be presented to the body of Christ. It has to be presented unto those who are the very embodiment of the representation of our soon coming king. The question is a very simple question. The question is as simple as this. Are the lights out? Are the lights out? Tell your neighbor, are the lights out? Are the lights out? Are the lights out? Oh, I'm not talking about uh, you can't sleep because all the lights are on the house. You can't sleep. You're thinking about the cost of the utility bill. You can't sleep all the lights. No, I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about a state of being in the church today. I'm talking about the way things seem to be in the church today. And I ask the question again, are the lights out? Are the lights out? We are blind unseen because the lights are out. Anybody walk through a dark house, you bump your knee, and my knee is my thing, right? Underneath my knee, I have this bone wide hit, and it just hurts real bad. It's like hitting a funny bone on the elbow. But you ever walk through the house, and you stub your toe, you hit your leg, you do something, and it hurts so much. And, and the reason that you did is because you cannot see. You cannot see. And why couldn't you see? Because the lights were out. The lights were out. Of course, we're talking about more than just the physical issues that you have when the lights are out. But we're talking about the spiritual issues that we're facing today because the lights are out. The lights are out. It's reciprocal in nature. Light begets light and dark begets dark. When the lights are off, you will have the blind leading the blind. Leading the blind. In that case today, we have many people who are blind that are leading the blind. They are more entertained and educating in your, in your walk with Christ. So you have the blind that are leading the blind because they can juggle, because they can shift knives, because they can do all these great and talented things. You have the blind that are leading the blind. And it really hurts me when I think about this. It's interesting to know that Jesus himself talked about the lights being out. 
in a parable, he spoke in a maze with no oil. And because they had no oil, when the bridegroom came, they could not see the bridegroom. They were not prepared because they had no oil. Having oil in your lap means more than just looking for the glorious moment in which Christ will crack the sky. It also means that you are patiently waiting and you're working while you wait. It means that you have not become so heaven bound you know earthly good. You are looking for the signs and, and you are working while looking for those signs that he is coming. Yes. It's because of his mercy and grace that he has not come thus far. Because believe me, if he came yesterday, many of us wouldn't have been in the right place. Many of us wouldn't have had our lamp with oil. Many of us wouldn't have had the lights out and we would have missed the coming of our king. I'm, I'm speaking to someone today because someone needs to know that it is time to turn the lights back on. It is time to turn the lights back on. It is time to turn the lights back on. Darkness is so prevalent in the church today. It's heartbreaking. In our everyday life, we see how we have not held up the blood-stained banner of Jesus at every opportunity. As Christians, we must defend our faith on every front. And our faith is being attacked mercilessly. Our faith is being pulled at mercy. We have so many things that are going on in the world that is totally contrary to our faith. You cannot have two faith working on the inside of you. You got to even believe the word of God or you got to believe the word of man. If you believe the word of God, oftentimes it does not line up with the word of man. And that's okay because the word of man needs to learn to line up with the word of God. Oh, I'm just here to tell you because we have so many people who are missing the mark. They're missing the mark. They are so educated in the education systems of the world, but don't know very little about the Bible. Why do you think they want to take the Bible out of the church, out of the school? They want to take the Bible out of the school because they didn't want people to be educated in the word of God. They want to be educated in the word of man. In the word of man, or have you thinking contrary to the word of God? The word of God says no more than 6,000 or so years are passed. But the word of man, which is always changing, that is always fallible, is saying that the world is millions of years old. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, my God. Oh, I'm going to help somebody today or somebody going to turn in some things today. Hallelujah. But as a Christian, we must defend our faith on every front. The attacks that they have against us are so subtle. Like the serpent in the garden who eases up to you. They're so subtle. What appears to be minor infractions are actually full-on attacks. In every fairy tale, you have a plot of good versus evil. You have a plot of good winning over evil. Can I help someone today? But even that good will not acknowledge that it's God who made things good. That good will acknowledge a fairy godmother. That good will acknowledge a, a good demon. That good will acknowledge something, but it won't acknowledge God. That good will acknowledge things such as a good witch. That good will acknowledge good monsters. That good will acknowledge something that's totally contrary to what our belief system says about demonology and such. Even in this attack, they will steal the glory that God alone should get. It's a slow chipping away of our faith. It's chipping away of our faith. And guess what? It's targeting our children. It's looking at our children trying to chip away at their faith. It's targeting our children in fairy tales. Whereas our children begin to think that good exists outside of God. What the word of God says, what Jesus said himself, he said that I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes unto God except for by me. But the word, the world will have you believing that you can come to God just because you are a good person. And because you're a good person, you can be saved because you are good. The world will have you thinking that. But Jesus clearly says, unless you come to me. He said, anyone else who tries to enter in is a thief. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, my God. I'm, I'm going to bless somebody today. It is a wake-up calling for the church today. Because the church has to learn to defend the faith. It's a calling today from God to the nations. The Lord got the hands of the writer here in duplicity as the words let us know that the high priest Eli was an aged man. He was old. 
He was old. He was in his 80s. He was on, on the verge of going out. He was an old man. His eyesight had physically began to wane, and he could not see as well as he used to see. His physical eyes were failing, but the writer didn't know. What the writer didn't know as he wrote this, God was going to allow us this day to realize that not only had his physical eyes failed, his spiritual sight began to fail too. Huh? His spiritual sight began to fail. How do I say this? Eli was a man of God. I say this because Eli, it took him three times to realize that God was speaking. It took him three times to realize that God was speaking. And it's interesting to know that uh, uh, God is speaking, but he's not even speaking to someone he's spoken to before. He's speaking to, he's speaking to Samuel. He's speaking to Samuel for the first time. So Samuel didn't recognize the voice of the Lord. Eli was so removed from hearing the voice of the Lord that Eli did not know that God was calling Samuel. When you are in touch with God, you're going to come to the realization when God is calling someone that you know. Because they'll come to you and they'll tell you a certain thing. And you'll be like, yeah, you need to answer. That's God calling you to something higher. Oh, my God, my God. It's all right. Amen, amen. Eli... Of course, he was a man of God who had failed. And as it goes with the pastor, and he was the pastor of all of Israel, so goes the congregation. Because his lights were out in the spiritual aspect, the light of Israel had went out. The light of Israel had went out. I'm bold in saying it, and I believe this is the case. As the spiritual lead of Israel faltered, so did the people that he was assigned to lead. Beloved, this is why I'm trying hard. I'm stretching myself. I'm pressing in. I want to be in an old shelter booth. I want to be in the presence of God because I don't want to fail my God. I want to make sure that I'm on the forefront of hearing the voice of God and what God is saying and telling me to do. I got to make sure because if I fail, those who follow me have a tendency to fail as well. Oh, my God, my God, my God. So Eli, the physical, the spiritual leader of Israel had failed. And Israel had failed as well. Beloved, may I say boldly that the eyes of many leaders in the church, and I'm speaking spiritual eyes, have waxed dim. And as a result of this blindness, we find the prophecy of Romans 1 being fulfilled in our eyes. Everybody know Romans 1 begins to talk about the state of the world, the state of the world, and how the world is. And there are so many things that Romans 1 talks about that are so prevalent in this day and age that we never thought that we would have it as it is. As we examine the scriptures here, as I examine the scripture in myself, my heart hurt and my heart began to ache thinking of the profoundness of the word of the Apostle Paul. The words that he wrote so many years ago, eons ago. It is so profound that surely it was the hand of God that overshadowed his hand and it wrote those words that were meant for us in this day and age to hear and receive and to understand and to press forward out of what those words were saying. Every stroke was written by God Almighty. Uh, in every word and every scripture, we find what we call societal norms today. Things that we never thought would ever happen in our lifetime. Things that we never thought would happen in our children's lifetime. They're happening today. And everything is so contrary to what the word of God is saying. It's because they're fighting against the word of God. It's not because they don't like you. It's because they chose not to have the word of God inside of their knowledge. They chose not to retain what it is that God, oh my God, I, I'm going to bless somebody today. Many, not many years ago, we never thought that the morality of our society would decay to the point of men marrying men. We never thought that there ain't no way. We had some folks that were weird around, but ain't no way that they're going to boldly come up out their closet and then demand to stand at the altar of God and be wedded in holy matrimony. That's unholy matrimony. They never thought when they first said you can have a civil union that somehow, some way, they would end up standing before the altar. When they had a civil union, they would go before the courts of the land and the courts of the land said, I now pronounce you husband and husband. The devil is a lie. But that really was not their goal. Their goal 
wasn't just being accepted in society in general. Their goal was to be accepted in the Christian faith. Their goal was to be accepted in what is the truth. They want the lie to come in and invade and ruin the truth. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Never in my lifetime, never in your lifetime, never in our children in our lifetime, we think that women would marry women. Never in our lifetime do we think that birth control do murder instead of abstinence. Uh, God, God's wrath has been held back for so long. God's wrath has been held back for so long. He's held back his wrath for so long. Oh my God, my God. He's held it back. He held it back. But we need to know that the wrath of God is coming and it's coming rapidly. We need to know that God's grace that he's had is being ready to be removed. And the grace that he had when he saw you in your foolishness allowed you to do foolish things is going to be removed. Why? Because he said, I've spoken to your hearts. I've told you what is right. But yet, if you choose to do what's wrong but I've told you what is right, I can turn you over to a reprobate mind. And I will turn you over to a reprobate mind. Hallelujah. As I, as I begin to read and study this, as I prepare for this sermon, almost every scripture speaks to the decay that's evidence in mankind today. As I began studying this, I, the Lord brought me over to Samuel, uh, chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 3. And it talked to me. And it spoke to me. And the Lord told me some things. And this child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. Samuel was not Eli's natural son. Samuel was Eli's adopted son. Oh, it's interesting to note that he was the adopted son. And traditionally what would happen was that mantle would be passed from the father to the son. But the sons of Eli were not worthy to carry on the mantle. And Samuel did not know it at the time that God was beginning to speak to him. Because God was getting ready to remove the mantle from the household of Eli and place the mantle on Samuel. It's something when God will raise your replacement in your own house and it's not even your child. It's something how God will do that. Hallelujah. And, and the word of God was precious in those days. <laughs> precious. What does it mean to be precious? What does it mean for the word of God to be precious? It means that the word is just so rare to find. You can't find the word in a good place. You can only, it can be like it was with uh, jumping Jehoshaphat when he was getting ready to go into battle and he was getting ready to battle and help King Ahab, the, uh, the, the husband of Jezebel. And all these people came before him with all these fables and tales, all these so-called prophets came before him, began to prophesy. Oh yeah, you're going to do this king, you're going to take him out, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. And then Jehoshaphat had a moment, he had a moment of, of, of sameness and he said, Is there not a word from the Lord? Is there not one prophet that can stand before the Lord? Is there not one prophet that will tell the truth? See, you have a lot of people who want to prophesy to you houses and land, but they won't tell you correction. They'll tell you you're going to have a car, you're going to have this, you're going to have that. But they don't tell you the part about you need to get things right with God in order for these things to come before you, in order for these things before you. You need to get things right with God. So many of us fall for these things. And we have this story here where Eli had fallen. Eli had failed. And because he had failed, the lights had went out. The light had went out because he failed. It's reciprocal. He failed and the light went out. The light went out because he failed. Huh? The light went out in his heart. He had lost his relationship with God. He had come to the point of religion. He would do all these sacrificial things that were supposed to be the healing of, of the people. He would sacrifice all these animals and, and so on and so forth when people brought the animals to him. But what his sons would do, his sons would literally be in the house of the Lord having sex with women. His sons would literally be, be contaminating the altar. His sons would literally go before the people and steal from the people the best meat that was coming for the sacrifice. And Eli knew this. He knew this. He knew this. So it speaks to us. When we know better, we should do better. If we fail to do better, when we know better, the wrath of God has been held in abeyance waiting for us to change. 
and the wrath of God is getting ready to be released into this earth. And I'm not trying to preach fire and brimstone. I'm preaching the truth. I'm telling you the truth that we need to get some things right in our lives. Why? Because in our lives we have issues that, that we are compromising on. The church should not be the one that's compromising. The church should not be compromising. Notice I say Eli's eyes are filled because of age, but also because he had lost his relationship with God. He had lost his relationship. First three drives home saying the lamp of God had went out in the temple. The implications of this is that the light of God has went out in many places. In society today, many men and women of God at the highest level in the church are more concerned about making money than they are about making disciples of the Christ. They're more concerned about the offering than they are about the offering of themselves before God for the use of God. They're more concerned about what kind of car they drive, what kind of suits they have on. They're more concerned about those things than they are about the people of God. They're more concerned about that. And because they're more concerned about these things, they're more concerned about numbers, they're more concerned about uh, numbers equating them being successful. They're so concerned about these things that they're numb. They're not really in a relationship anymore. It's time for the men, men and women of God, to stand up and be right. They're taking preaching on as a job and not a passion. They're compromising and accepting what is not godly as godly. We have preachers nowadays who openly know that their musicians are in adulterous affairs. They openly know that their musicians are homosexual. They openly know, but they just so talented that they will not sit them down. We have no compromising today about the things of God. Compromise equates to every door, every seat in here being filled, people being out there. Because I'm telling you, oh, the Lord getting ready to bless you with a house. He's blessing you with a car. Oh, your man is on the way. Your woman is on the way. Your wife, your husband on the way. If I began to preach to you like that, then the doors, you would have to be here on time to get a seat. But because I'm preaching you the truth, the thing about the truth, the truth is singular. The truth has one way. The truth is not spread out like the lies. See, it takes a lot of lies to try to cover the truth. But the truth prevails. The truth comes out and removes all the lies. It's something. I can agree with the words found in verse 1 here. It says, the word of God was rare in those days. It is becoming rarer even today. Rarer even today. The pure, unchanging, unadulterated, the infallible word of God. Can I get someone's attention for just a moment? The infallible word of God. The truth of the word of God is becoming so rare today. Why? Because people want the word to be what they want it to be instead of what the word is. They want to have their own method of relationship with God. Yes, you do have a relationship with God, but guess what? Your relationship ain't that great, baby. I'm just here to tell you. They want things to be the way that they want it, but you did not get up on the cross and die for anyone. Huh? And if you got up on the cross and you died, you want to stay down. You won't raise up an all power and authority. You cannot have it your way. This is not Burger King. This is Christianity. You cannot have your whopper with your ketchup the way that you want it. You cannot have that. You have to have it the way that God has presented it. He has laid out a path for us to be saved and for us to live saved. And we have to live and walk that path. If we don't live and walk that path, then we are doomed. Oh, not enough preachers are telling people that hell is real. They're not telling them that. They'll have you believing that hell is a fairy tale place. They have you believing that hell is not something that God will send you to. But see, as long as God is a loving God, He's a just God. And if you don't live your life the way that you're supposed to, God will send you to Him. And He'll love you while you're burning. Huh? We need to we need to be able to see this, that the light has went out. They turn off the light. They turn off the light. They turn them off. The lights have been turned off. This is as sure as if you were uh, uh, owing money to MLG and W or West Memphis Power and you ain't paying your bill, they will eventually turn off the light. 
They'll turn it off and they'll think nothing of it. Huh? The same if you're not putting your time in before the Lord. Then the light will go out. The light will be smothered by the things of this world. Huh? And the darkness will rush in. And the light is no longer there. This is what we're talking about. This is what we're talking about. I'm praying someone's receiving this today. The warnings of Paul were so profound. It was so profound. It was so profound. It was so profound that there's no way we would have to guess what is it that Paul is talking about. We don't have to guess. We don't even have to guess what society would be like in the last days because these are the last days. And society is the very way that Paul describes society. A bunch of stubborn people who don't want to hear what God has said. And they strive to not hear what God has said. They get an attitude when you tell them what thus said the word of God. They begin to take the word of God and they begin to render their own truth out of the word of God. Instead of receiving the truth that sent the word of God. I was reading something not too long ago and it just disturbed my spirit. Where this preacher married another man. And they call him the first man in the church. Huh? Huh? This is so out of alignment of the word of God. This is out of alignment. This is not in accordance with the scripture. And everything that is unfruitful is going to eventually die off. You can't continue to say, I'm going to plant this seed in this concrete and expect for that seed to flourish. It won't flourish. Because it doesn't have the nutrients. Because God has not established and said this is how things are. So therefore it's not going to flourish. It's going to eventually die. These warnings from Paul are so profound. So profound. That we in the body have to be the leaders of godliness. The leaders of godliness and quick to show our reverence of the Lord. God called us to reverence him above the unsaved. God has called us in, in Psalms 89 and 7. It says, he is greatly to be feared in the assembly of his saints. Not just the church building, but the glory that you should carry should go outside of the church. People should not have to question where you are saved or not. Even if they don't know what salvation looks like, because a lot of people don't know what salvation looks like today. They should be able to notice that there's something different about you. You're not like everybody else. You're very uncommon. Whereas everyone else thinks about, I'm going to party, I'm going to do this, I'm doing all these things. Whereas you don't think in those terms. You think of the things that are good and of good report before God. It used to be the Christians would carry their holies as a badge of honor. But nowadays, a lot of Christians are kind of rejecting their holiness. There used to be Christians would work. To make sure that their badge of honor showed up before God. And their badge of honor is not just in the church. Because we have a whole bunch of church saints. A whole bunch of Sunday saints in the church today. They so super saved on Sunday. But the moment they walk out the door. They cussing and fussing and everything. Huh? So super saved before the people. But the moment they leave. But God is calling us to a wholeness beyond that. Pull up uh, Psalms 101, 2, 3. Psalms 101, 2 to 3. I want to show you something. I want to show you what God is saying to us as a church. Hallelujah. Psalms 101. Anybody got that? Psalms 101. You pull it up, Sister Shaker. Psalms 101. I want to, I want to minister to you about how we should live our lives. Psalms 101, go down to verse 2. Verse 2. There it is. Let me put my spectacles on so I can see that. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk where? Within where? Where at? Didn't say in the house of the Lord only. It says where within where? 
my house with a perfect car. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave unto me. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. We got people that binge watch. Everybody know what binge watching is? What binge watching is? You, you find something that you uh, like the first episode, you begin to watch. And that thing is not something righteous. Guess what? You're putting all this stuff into your spirit. By the time the 20th episode goes off, you turn off the TV, you try to sleep, and all those things that were in that episode begin to just be inside your spirit, begin to germinate, begin to, and you're sitting up there all night long trying to review things. You're binge watching, you're putting the wrong thing inside of you. And because the wrong thing is going on the inside of you, the wrong thing is producing wrong things on the outside of you and inside of you. You, you got to be very careful and conscious. See, it says, I will walk within my house with a perfect car. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I was hearing a preacher talking about this yesterday and I say it all the time. I say it all the time. I can't watch just anything. I can't watch every Lifetime movie that comes on. I can't watch every movie that's supposed to be Christian that comes to the theater. I can't. I can't. I cannot look because I am a man of God, but I do have a man's nature. I am a man as well. Amen. So I can watch everything that comes on. And then the same token, you being women, you being other men, you, you cannot watch everything that comes on. You cannot let everything get inside of your spirit. Because you begin to think a way that is totally contrary to the way God wants you to think. And you begin to live a life that's totally contrary to the way that God wants you to live your life. Christianity seems to have lost its footing today. We are in the body, have to be leaders of the world. We have to lead. We got to be saved, not just at church. We got to be saved, not just when times are hard, when the, when the bills are due, when, when, when our health begins to fail. We got to be saved, not just in Sunday morning. We got to be saved all the time. All the time. We have to live our lives saved. Why not? Well, because guess what? You cannot live your life saved, uh, unsaved, out of the presence of God. You can live your life wherever you want to live it, however you want to live it. God sees all. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He sees everything that you do, so therefore you can't hide anything from God. And you want God to pour into you as a vessel. Huh? First lady saying, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Pure and holy, tried and true. And with thanksgiving, I'll be a living. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living. Not just at church be a living, but I'm going to be a living all the time. Living righteous before God. Because this is so important. This is so important. Lots of us compromise. Because so many are uncomfortable with sharing our faith. Huh? Uncomfortable with sharing our faith with others. This uncomfortableness comes from either you're uncomfortable sharing because you don't know, you don't really know your faith, but it sounds good on paper. Huh? It's you're, you're uncomfortable uh, uh, because because you're not living your faith. You're not living it. When you begin to live something, it's comfortable. Huh? It's comfortable. I've been driving for about 40 years now driving for 40 years and I get behind the wheel or I get in the passenger seat and I get ready to teach somebody how to drive I'm comfortable I'm comfortable no matter how bad they drive Kendrick. no matter how bad they drive I'm still comfortable huh? no matter how bad they drive even when I was teaching my sons how to drive a stick shift no matter how many times Ryan hit those gears wrong I still was okay with it I said it's alright because I'm comfortable with it because I've been doing this for so long. So therefore, when you just grow, when you grow comfortable in your placement in the Lord, when you grow comfortable in how your relationship is with the Lord, it's so easy to share with other people. It's easy to, to tell them about how good God is. Once you grow comfortable with who God is in your life, it's so easy. And how are you going to grow comfortable? Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing what? The word of God. If all you're hearing is 
a bunch of garbage in, garbage in, garbage out. But if you're hearing the word of God, the true word of God, you become so comfortable and so, not, not complacent, but so comfortable with the presence of God being in your life that whenever you see someone who's not saved and you see them going through something, you know there's something that they need and you know what they need is on the inside of you and you're able to share. The word tells us to study to show yourself approved. The word tells us to have the word meditate in your heart when, day, and night. Are the lights out? Are the lights out? Are the lights out? That's my question. Are the lights out? The church is like this. It, it used to be the church would say, what must I do to be saved? But now the church is like, what can I still do and still be saved? How much compromise can I have? How much can I do and get away with it and God won't be angry with me? A sin is a sin. And God's righteousness is standing before us even today saying that a sin is a sin. We as Christians have to be very careful. It's something we're no longer convicted when we see or do ungodly things. We place our own ambitions and goals above living a godly life. We allow ungodly activities to reign around us. We lust to participate in the profane things that Christians should be revolted by. Uh, vulgar things, unfaithful things such as Christian horoscope. The devil is alive. I'm a Virgo. I'm going to read my horror scope says today. That's profane before God. God said have no dealings with witch and witchcraft. We have no problem taking our children to see the latest Harry Potter movie even though the Harry Potter movie is using real, real spells and witchcraft. And have our children's mind thinking in terms of, I'm going to cast a spell. I'm going to shoot ropes out of man. I'm going to do these things that God say are ungodly. Christians, this going to mess some up. Christians that want to participate in yoga, you better study it. You better know what yoga is. You better know that yoga, if you haven't noticed, has a whole bunch of bowing positions in it. And when you bow, who are you bowing before? When you bow, you're supposed to bow before one God. Huh? Christians better be very careful. You better be careful because some of those stretches are used to worship idols. Christians whose heart are not broken by the death of countless children at the hands of the abortionists. Not even touched, not even phased. Recently, this guy who's an abortion doctor for many years uh, died, and they began to clean out a storage room that belonged to him. And as they cleaned out the storage room, they, they, they realized, because he had an abortion clinic all over the state of Illinois, I believe it was. As they cleaned out the storage room, they ran upon 2,000 containers of feet, fetuses. 2,000 babies that were aborted that were stuffed in jars, who were pickled in jars. 2,000. Now, that's bad enough. The number is horrific within itself. But what really gets me is that they said it was a two-year time period, less than a two-year time period, that he had aborted all these children. And if you don't know, a year is 365 days. Huh? So a year is 365 days. 365 times 2 is uh, what? Uh, quick math, quick math, 10. 700 and some days. So do the math. In reality, Sister Glory, he had been killing more than a child a day. More than a child, thinking nothing of it. We as Christians have got to stand up for what is right. What is right? We've got to stand up for what is right and stop allowing the enemy to use us to turn the world against God. We as Christians have to be broken when things are terrible. When things are the way that they are. When things are contrary to God. When we find ourselves in circumstances whereas we are openly voting for and advocating those who call a living being an innocent child. They call it a matter of choice. 
a matter of choice. We can't defend them. And we should not be defending them. We cannot and should not be defending them. But they call a child a lump of something. A lump of something. The Bible says that God says that before you were even formed in the womb, I knew you. So you were important to me before you were really formed in the womb. He said, it says, in the, in the Bible says that, that before your limbs formed, <laughs> before your limbs formed, I knew you. So you are important before your limbs even formed in the womb of God. And, and you are important. And a child is important. So we got to get away from calling a child a choice. You made it. Why not give a child a chance to make it? Why not give the child a chance to make it? I'm thinking this guy has 2,000 fetuses, over 2,000 fetuses. How many doctors and lawyers, how many bankers, how, how many politicians, how many great authors, how many talented musicians did he have stuff in jars? How many? How many did he have stuffed in jars that would have came up for a cure, with a cure for HIV or cancer? How many did he have stuffed in jars that had the cure for diabetes? How many did he have stuffed in jars? Oh, we as Christians have to be real with what we call our faith. We have to be real. We have to be real. This is a wake-up call as we're so close to the end. We're too close to the end to play with God. We're surely in the last days because we're acting just like they did in the days of Noah. Jesus said that in the days of Noah, they sang, they married, they enjoyed life. They didn't think nothing of the things that they did. It's my thing, doing what I want to do. I'm going to dance to my own music. I'm going to do what I want to do. And, and eventually when something happens, I'm not going to turn to God to ask God to fix it. And if I do turn to God and God does fix it, I'm going to go right back to my bumming. We're acting the same way they did in the days of Noah, where a preacher is crying out to you, saying, let's get some things right, but yet we're acting the same way. We're doing things totally contrary to the purpose that God has in us. I'm building an ark myself. Not a physical ark, but a spiritual ark. And I'm crying out. I'm crying out. I'm crying out from this day forward. I'm crying out from this day forward. Huh? Why? Because we have to stand up for what is right. In the city of Memphis, which is the central most located city in the United States of America, just in case you didn't know, we're the most centrally located city in the United States of America. In the center of Memphis, Tennessee, there is an area that is called um, Young Cooper. Cooper Young. Cooper Young. Anybody know what Cooper Young is? Good food down there, don't you? Cooper Young. You know what Cooper Young is, Brother Charlie? Cooper Young. Cooper Young is the centralist, most located sit, uh, uh, neighborhood in the city of Memphis. And if you don't but know what's going on in Cooper Young, they're getting ready to paint at the corner of Cooper and Young a rainbow. Now, those who know the word of God know that a rainbow is God's promise. But those who don't really know the word of God are those who choose to, because a lot of people do know, they choose to just thumb their nose at God. The rainbow symbol means acceptance of all sexual persuasions. Now, see, you better get it right because you need to understand that not only in your lifetime have you seen men marry women, Marry men and women marry women. Not only you see in your lifetime, you gotta be conscious that eventually you're gonna have pedophiles. They're gonna want to marry your daughter. Huh? Want to abuse your son. You're gonna have them and they're gonna say, Well, where's my right? I got a right. But in the centralmost city, in the centralmost neighborhood, in the center of that neighborhood, they're getting ready to paint this rainbow. Why? Well, you want to know why? When you talk about the middle, what do you talk about? You talk about the heart, right? The center, where everything is happening at. This is why they want that central neighborhood. This is why they want that center 
most street in that central neighborhood. Because what affects what comes out of the heart affects all, everything. That's why the Bible tells us to guard our hearts with all diligence because out of it comes what? The issues of life, every issue of life. We've got to stand up as Christians and stop letting everything just bowl us over and be fucked with us. Stop thinking, well, so-and-so's uh, responsibility, this pastor's responsibility to pray against that. I need some people to help me pray. I need some people who are willing to help me pray because you don't see, you don't see, you need to see the detriment of that life's persuasion. It's killing us. It's killing us. Let me move on and get up on my soapbox. But we're too close to the end, you know, for us to turn back now. My heart cries when I think of Romans, Romans 1, especially verse 18. It says, the wrath of God has turned from heaven. It's being revealed from heaven against all, not some, but all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. The wrath of God who hold the truth in unrighteousness. You know the truth, but you try to make the truth the truth that you want it to be. You hold the truth in unrighteousness. How do you hold the truth in unrighteousness? This is explained in the next verse saying that all man knows, uh, that all man knows that God exists. They know that something greater exists on the outside of them. They know that something great exists on the outside that should be on the end. They know that something great exists. But they turn away from it. They fight against it. But knowing the truth is all men, it means not just all men, it means just it means the church also. When the church knows the truth, it turns away from the truth. When the truth, church knows better, but choose to act in contradiction to the truth of the word, that's something to behold. Yet in these scriptures, the Lord is speaking of the church. He's talking about the church. He's talking about the state of the church. What the church will tolerate, what the church will love. God is speaking to the church because we're the ones who know the truth. And because we know the truth, we need to stand by and with the truth. When we've seen miracles, but yet we deny the power of God. When God has helped us, when God has protected our lives supernaturally, but yet we deny the authority of God. When, when we're still in God's glory thinking it's all because of me, because I got this great job. It's because I'm so talented. I'm so good looking. I'm so, you're thinking like that. See, you're denying the glory of God. You're denying God's grace that God has given you to have grace with the people who allowed you in the position in the first place. And the thing is that the last day we ain't gonna have no excuse. None. No, you ain't gonna have no excuse. Well, Lord, I cast out thing. No, you ain't gonna have no excuse. Lord, I did such and such. Well, you ain't, yeah, okay, there is power in the name of Jesus, but if you didn't do it for the purpose of Christ, God's still gonna get that glory. But if you didn't do it for a godly purpose, it means absolutely. Nothing in terms of getting you into the gate. We ain't gonna have no excuse. None. None. Because innate inside of us is a calling to righteousness. Innate inside of us, you call it your conscience, is a calling to righteousness. Innate. A puppy, a newborn puppy does not have to be told to find the mother's breast in order to be nursed. It's innate. He knows it. A, a cat does not have to. It, it's innate. They know it. It's innate. They know it. And when the baby, when the puppy or the cat or the kid crawls up to the mother, the mother doesn't repel and kick him away because it's innate in her to know it. It's innate in us to know that there is a God. And there's a greater presence. There is a, we, it's innate in us to know. You can't say that I did not know. You do. That when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful. But became vain in their imaginations. I'm not thankful. I'm not appreciating anything. Ooh, this is good because I'm so good. Vain in your imaginations. Vain in your imaginations. And your foolish, their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. I'm so smart. 
But God called those who said they're smart because they think they're smart fools. If you don't know that your intelligence came from God, if you didn't know that your presence came, if you didn't know that. And here's the part that really gets me. Verse 23, Psalms, not Psalms, but Romans chapter 1, verse 23. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Now we ain't got many people running around and worship things like that today. The things we worship have four wheels on the ground and a steering wheel. And a very nice uh, studio sound, uh, studio surround sound. But folks, the stuff that we worship today has windows and doors. The stuff that we worship today allows us to get a W2. Huh? So we don't go around worshiping all these things unless you belong to the church of Beyonce. We don't go around worshiping all these things. But what we do is we go around worshiping things that are innate, can't do us a bit of good. The moment you buy that car, the moment you drive out the parking lot begins to lose value. You got to learn to put your trust in things that are above and not things to be. Because things that are above will not perish. Things that are above are not going to be stolen. Things that are above will not rust away. But things that are beneath will perish. They will be stolen. They will rust away. The Bible tells us that, right? Oh, amen, somebody. Because worshiping is just that it's valuable. This is my all. Worshiping is just that it's complimenting. Worship is just that it's the bragging on, and we have plenty of bragging on material things. Worship is just that dependency of on something. Uh, not, not many going to worship those other things I was talking about, but people worship things nonetheless. Nonetheless. And look at this. I double dog dare anyone who's living homosexual lifestyle to explain this scripture here to me. Romans 18. I said double dog there. Romans 18, 27. And likewise, also the men leading the natural use of the woman burn their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseen and receiving unto them their, the recompense of their error which was me. The recompense of their error, which was meat. Someone needs to open their eyes and notice this is real. Stand on your feet, y'all. Hallelujah. Stand on your feet. Someone needs to know that this is real. You need to know this is real. This is nothing to play with. This is real what we're talking about. Huh? As real as the miracle of you walking, because Scientifically, engineering-wise, there's no way that you should be able to walk when your feet are a whole lot shorter than your... Huh? There's no way. There's no way you should be able to balance on these things. That's scientifically. But God has placed inside of us the miracle to be able to walk, and we don't even acknowledge that. This is real to talk about here. Are the lights out? I mean, are the lights out in the church? I mean, the church should be the God and light of the world. It says that we should be a lamp on the side of the hill that lights the way to salvation. Are the lights out? We need to wake up. Wake up and start being real and righteous with God. Wake up. The time is going too short. We need to wake up. Wake up. It's going to take some seeing animals walking two by two to believe that God is getting ready to do something. We need to wake up because this is something that's real. This is not nothing to play with. My God, my question I pose to you, are the lights out? Ask your neighbor, are the lights out? Tell your other neighbor, are the lights out? It's time for us to turn on the light of God in our lives. Amen. We've got to turn on the light. We've got to know that the light is, I'm not talking about the weight of something. I'm talking about the severity of sin. I'm talking about what God is saying about the church today. My Bible is clear. God said that anything unfruitful will not multiply. You may think it's going to multiply, but it will not multiply. 
we have a man who's running for president. I, I'm trying to remember his name. Booting or something like that. Married to another man. Married to another man. He's running for president of the United States. Married to another man. And if we don't pray this down, we're going to find ourselves in total allegory against God. We're going to find ourselves in the position of Sodom and Gomorrah as a nation. As a nation. Huh? We're going to find ourselves in total contradiction with God. We are. We are. If we don't pray this thing down and stand up for what is right, you might as well go and kill your own children because this nation is going to kill your children one way or another. They're going to kill your child before they're born as an abortion, or they're going to kill your child by allowing your child to be forced into marrying somebody who's a pedophile. It's going to happen. Mark my word, it's going to happen if we not, not as, as if the church does not stand up and say no more. No more. Somebody said no more. No more. No more. No more. Hallelujah. Glory unto God. We have got to stand up as a church and turn the lights back on because the light's been off too long. The light's been off too long, you know. When, when I get up out of the bed in the morning, Sister Glory, if I'm out of the bed and, and if I don't have a night light on or whatever, I'll stumble over and I'll turn on the light so I can see and stuff, right? But I'm not going to stumble past the light switch where I know it's over the wall and keep on walking down the hallway toward the kitchen because I'm going to stumble my toes more. When I see where the light switch is, now I'm going to hit that light switch so that I can see further. We cannot stumble around in the dark thinking that we're doing what is right before God. When God has called what we're doing unrighteous. Oh God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father. We stand before you in the name of your son, Jesus. Asking, Lord God, for forgiveness for allowing our lights to go out. Not replenishing our oil, Lord God. And not allowing your light to shine in us, oh God. Lord, we do not want to miss, Lord God, the coming of Christ because we have our lights out. We don't want to miss that. Oh God, my God. But Father God, we're praying right now that you would just bless us whereas we are able to see what you're saying to the church, how you're saying it to the church. And Lord God, we become more doers of the word than just hearers. That we would hear and adhere and apply this word to our lives in every way, shape, or fashion. That we would hear and adhere to what thus said the spirit of the living God to the church in this day and age. Oh God. I know that there's some conviction. And because there is some conviction going on here, I need for everyone to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm turning the light back on. The light is back on. Hallelujah. Father, you heard your people. You heard their cry, oh God. You heard their confession, oh God. You heard their words of repentance, Father God. And that the lights have been turned back on, Lord God, so that we may draw people unto Christ. Because we know that darkness repels. Light draws. Darkness repels. Light draws. And Father God, our lights are back on. It's in Jesus' name. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Clap your hands if God's been real good to you. Oh, he's been better than you have. Clap your hands if he's been super good to you. Word is Now somebody open your mouth and lift your right hand and say, Word! I pray that you enjoyed the word today and that it touches you within a deep place in your heart and it will spark a change that should come about in your life. If the Lord so touched your heart and you have a desire to give, you can give to this ministry as we continue to make impacts in this city at our Givelify app. Simply download the Givelify app at one of the app or the Google store and look for Interceding Christian Center. Here at Interceding, we aspire to Bring people to spiritual knowledge and thus victory. God bless you.